Greetings and welcome to Beatles Stuffology, where two old friends sit about and talk BS, Beatles stuff, on a track by track basis pretty much for the sake of it. My name is JG McQuarrie and I'm here with my co-host Andrew Deacon. Say hi Andrew. Hello, how are you? I'm doing quite well, thank you. How are you? I am marvellous. Are you waiting for a letter this week? Uh, no, no, because as we know, um, post has declined significantly in the last 30, 40 years, so all we really get is junk mail. Yeah, that seems like a fair assessment. But I suppose if we have to put the walls of the post office to one side, we'll have to talk about their past, which means this week we are covering Please Mr Postman. What a smooth transition that turned out to be. Oh, perfect. So, um, yeah, yeah, smooth and silky, as one would expect from the level of professionalism that we regularly provide to our listeners. Well, you've already overlooked my, my comment about being marvellous. So. Well, yes. Oh, well, yes. Excellent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, oh, well, let's just get started. <laughs> um, <laughs> for, the sake of, uh, for the sake of our listeners, um, we were having some technical issues before we started recording, and I feel, I feel slightly discombobulated now, so you'll have to excuse me my slightly lame start to this episode but oh well never mind let's crack on what do you think of please mr postman oh it's filler isn't it it's it's nice filler but it's but it's filler um and and i think that's probably why when sort of thinking of lots of things to talk about uh during this episode very little of it actually seems to conform with what you might regard as being the beatles performance yeah it's not a towering classic as uh, of the album i think it's fair to say it's a weird kind of cover version normally uh, like we were talking about till there was you uh last week um and the amount of sort of precision that went into it and the sort of the technical ability and the the quality of uh, effort that the the band put into it to get it really precise like the the you know the exact tossed off feeling of the guitar solo and the the, the three thousand chords that are in it and everything else this is very much that song's antithesis, I would suggest, which is to say they just stand up, belt it out and bugger off. There's there's, there's not a lot of um, patience or time, um, I think, that's been put into this one particularly. It's it's just kind of blasted out and, and then on to the next one. But then I, I would say, and, and this is just about the only thing I've got this. Well, actually, there's, there's two things. Two things. <laughs> really, I, I want to sort of drop into the conversation about the performance of the song. Um, and and one of them is the fact that the, their vocals make it sound um, very different emotionally to the the Marvelettes original, which I get the feeling is 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 sort of quite pleading and and desperate. Whereas you know Lennon's vocals and the backing vocals as well make it sound really quite uh, angry and and depressed. They're, they're a lot more upset about not getting this letter than the Marvelettes are. The Marvelettes are just disappointed really yeah it's it's definitely a song where the the cover version has changed the emotional tenure of the song i think this is actually one of the songs i know you're not a big fan of of john lennon's singing voice per se but i think this is one of the songs which would actually really benefit if it had been george or paul that had been singing it uh lennon steamrollers this song i mean he just he screeches it out with the same kind of emotional cadence as, as Twist and Shout. And that's not really what this song needs. It's, it's uh, subtlety is just annihilated in this version. And it's not like the original was massively subtle. Um, but in, in terms of that kind of just belting it out approach, it just it smothers any kind of emotional content that the song really has. Like you said, instead of that kind of pleading or kind of even slightly whimsical in the, in the Marvelettes version as well, um, that kind of tone is completely lost here. And so because it's basically just being shouted out, it, it, it can't help but come across as kind of very ag- aggressive and particularly in Lennon's quite sort of nasal drone, which I don't necessarily mean as an insult, but that's just what he sounds like. But, uh, but uh, you know, it, it, that, that flattens it still further. But a slightly sweeter voice, like McCartney's voice, I can imagine would be a little bit closer to the original, but he would still be able to find some kind of emotional space to to put something into it. And even even George, who has a fairly thin voice at this point in his career. Um, but that that would also kind of, I think, maybe lend this cover version that emotional, maybe fragility with George. Um, I think he would sound quite fragile singing the song. Um, and that would, again, give a slightly different emotional palette. But that just, just screaming it out just does not work for this song. So then I wonder if they had changed the, the vocalist, whether or not my, my second point might have been addressed. And that, of course, is the comparison to Boys from the first album, in that here 
they do change the uh, the gender and it is since I heard, heard from that girl of mine and um, you know there must be some word today from my girlfriend so far away um, and I wonder if that kind of knocks a little bit of the playfulness and the fun out of it as well because it's now just a case of right we're going to do the cover but we're also just going to tweak it so that you know everybody knows everybody knows there's no risk of any miscommunication here uh, which of course is interesting bear in mind all the supposed rumors about him and and brian and you know all of that sort of stuff yeah i think it does i think it does knock some of the fun out of it as well it's actually slightly weird to hear the song girlfriend in a song sung by the beatles it's not really a word that they use you get girl you get baby you get child you get sweetheart you get a whole bunch of things but actual girlfriend it just isn't a world a word that you hear that often in in beatles songs so it kind of especially not at this point in the, it, it, their career it, it kind of sticks out and it's not a word that lennon seems comfortable singing um now whether that's because it's gender flipped and he's used to singing boyfriend if he was singing along with the records or whatever but i mean they, they played this song a lot by all accounts in 1962 so you would think he would have got used to singing it at some point but he seems weirdly uncomfortable whenever he has to sing girlfriend and i don't I don't really know what that is, but it, it really stood out for me when I listened. I hadn't listened to this song in, oh God, years and years. I can't remember the last time I listened to this album and certainly not um, this cover version. And it just really stood out how odd that word feels in John Lennon's mouth. So, okay, right. Well, this this is where, where you're going to have a, a clear argument with uh, setlist.fm because they've got them uh down as only having played this live four times oh really yeah including once in 1962 so um fight everyone <laughs> there's only one way to find out yeah um i i'm not sure that's right because i was reading the um ian mcdonald book earlier on which i have now got in front of me so if you'll forgive a, a brief bit of my dulcet caledonian tones uh reading from it the Beatles played it frequently during 1962, but it had lapsed from their act by 1963 and required some time to get right in the studio. That's from, uh, yeah, Revolution in the Head. So, yeah, um, I'm going to have to fight setlift.fm, I'm afraid. Oh, so that's okay. I mean, all I would say is obviously Ian McDonald's famous for his sloppy research. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. He will know, or his solicitors, uh, or his estate, if he's no longer alive, will know. Well, that was a uh, anyway. Never mind. Um, and we've we've said many times when uh, referring to setlist.fm, of course, because it's a, a crowdsourced uh, website that there's ever such a slight chance that there might be mistakes on it. So um, I'm I'm quite happy to uh, um, to believe that it would have been in their setlist um, on lots of occasions. So no problem there. Although of course there is a fade out on this, and you know I just sort of wonder if they had played it a lot. Might they perhaps have had a um, a sharper ending as they they quite often do? But hey, we're into the realms of speculation here. Yeah, I mean, it might just be as simple as something as screwing up the take in the studio, and I'll just fade before the mistake comes in. Uh, it it could be something as simple as that, but uh, who knows? As you say, a realm of speculation. But either way, yeah, that word "girlfriend" sticks out, and and Lennon isn't comfortable singing it, and and there's just a weird sense that he doesn't feel. It's not just that word, but I don't think he feels right, very invested in this song as well. And we know that this was recorded under, you know, great pressure, great speed, etc., etc., even if not quite as much speed as, as Please Please Me. So I'm sure there was plenty of pressure to just get it done, get on to the next one. But there's no real sense, I don't think, that he's invested in this song. He doesn't sound like he's really waiting for a letter. He sounds like, I've got to sing this bloody thing. Let's get it done. Um, maybe, and it, maybe it's he's, very undermining. Maybe he's got sympathy for, um, you know, the working class. And, and the, <laughs> the, the song seems to blame, um, put a lot of the blame on the, the poor postman rather than on the person who has not sent the bloody letter, uh, which I think is grossly unfair. And in fact, at various points in there, it seems to be inducing the postman into doing something that would get them fired by just basically handing over mail that belongs to somebody else. So, you know, maybe maybe his sympathies were really with the postman. Well, yeah, maybe. In fact, you say that you, he's they're inducing something which you get postman fired. Um, given that this is an American song, in fact, it's a federal offence to uh, to inter interfere with uh, with uh, post. So it's it's even worse than firing. It's it's actually a, a proper offence. 
Um, yeah, maybe. I feel, again, we may be sort of wandering into the realms of speculation without a lot of justification other than, you know, this maybe isn't Lennon's best performance. Well, yeah, fair enough. I, I just think that, that maybe criticising government agencies was probably more in George Harrison's oeuvre at this stage. Uh, yeah. In the run-up to, say, Taxman uh, than, than John Lennon. <laughs> but you can see where we're going with this as a song because it is, it's, it's, yeah, it's perfectly fine. Get it in, get it done. Um, it fills up a, a nice space on the album before you then move on to something else. Um, but it's it's not something that lasts too long in the memory. So, um, and that's that's kind of why you know when thinking about this, I sort of used it as a um, as a springboard to kind of almost re-educate myself about other things that were going on at the times. And I don't know a huge amount about Motown. Um, but it was sort of then interesting diving in and looking at the original recording. Um, for example, could you tell me who the drummer was on the Marvelettes recording of Please, Mr. Postman? Um, yes. Oh, damn it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is, it is a good, good useless fact. Cause it's Marvin Gaye, isn't it? It is. It is. Absolutely. Who was also um, drummer on um, Dancing in the Street. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. There you go. Okay. So, I mean, the the general gist was that um, when he started at Motown, they had lots of um, piano keyboard players. So he was just effectively determined to stick around. They needed drummers. He said, sure, I'll do that. Never really drummed before. But he picked it up quite naturally. I mean, you could almost go as far to say that he was doing what he needed to do to stay in the band, which makes a nice link to McCartney. Um, you know, in terms of him switching to bass because, hey, the other guys have got guitars. Their guitars are better than yours, so you can play bass. Um, but then it just reminds me, I, you sometimes have these weird memories of um, you know, some sort of revelation. And I can remember seeing, and I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but you might want to keep a tally for how many times this song gets mentioned during the, these podcasts. Uh, the video for Spies Like Us. Oh. The, the McCartney hit of the early to mid 1980s from that classic film. Um, and of course, he plays different instruments in the studio on that. And I think that was probably the first time I saw McCartney behind a drum kit and probably thought, oh, well, yeah, God, he's, he's obviously just mucking around for the video. Little did I know that actually pretty darn good at it. The song Spies Like Us is the best thing about Spies Like Us. Not that there's an awful lot of competition. Anyway, yeah, sorry, uh, off topic. Um, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Uh, it does It does. Does provide that link there. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's one of those songs that I only really like the Marvelettes version. There's, again, there's about 70 bajillion versions on uh, Spotify. And basically none of them are really very good, except for their one. It does have a slightly... Um, I don't know quite exactly. I don't want to just use the word charm because that seems too dismissive. Yeah. But it, it it is really charming. Their version is is lovely. It's really really that. But that 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 charm or that little uh, and there's a slight sense of innocence about it. It's it's very sweet. All those words sound like they're pejorative, but I don't mean them that way at all. And that the delicacy of that charm is lost basically in every other cover version of this song. I think it, it's a sign of how at that stage, 61, that um, songwriting in America was ad in advance of, of where it was in the UK. And we have spoken before about the way in which, um, you know, Carol King and Jerry Goffin, um, you know, were writing songs and they're slightly different expression, more mature expressions of, of love and feelings. And here, it's a love song. It's a song about loss and being forgotten by the one you love. But by framing it through the, you know, the Mr. Postman and the delivery of the letters, it's so much more interesting. And, you know, I'm not saying it's, you know, it's Pulitzer Prize uh, worthy, but it's just a different way of, of looking at it um, that really works. And, you know, if you want to then compare it, I mean, it's not a letter song. We're not going to go in, into into that again. But if you compare it to P.S. I Love You, that that whole sense of, um, you know, oh, I'm going to sit right down and, um, oh, and write a letter and I'm going to send it to you and I'm going to say I love you, which is all kind of very A, B, C. 
this just kind of approaches it from a really different perspective there's there's like a um a conduit between the the two people who supposedly love each other and you can't appeal to the person that you love because they are so far away pre-mobile phone technology kids okay um so therefore this is the only person you've got to 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 sort of pour your heart out to so it's 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 really good in that sense it's it's it, you know it's different and, and interesting um obviously you know the beatles are, are partially responsible for um you know the british music industry scene catching up with that sort of thing over the years so therefore it's interesting that they're reaching back into that that sort of uh, songwriting oeuvre a little bit french for you there i know how much you love it um and and using it for themselves whilst they're developing their own skills and yeah and and i think in that sense it 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 just kind of works it's a little homage to where they are and and the sort of things that they listen to um so it's fine it's absolutely fine i mean it's you know so um yeah and at that point you just sort of go uh, um yeah but what it is though is it's um in a fine tradition whether or not it started a tradition i don't know but it is in a fine tradition of songs about occupations Yes, well, we will get to paperback writer at some point, but we will. Um... <laughs> well, it's not just paperback writer. We've mentioned, of course, Taxman, and yeah. uh, there's Doctor Robert as oh, well. God, yeah. uh, and you can make a case for um, Drive My Car if you really want to. You might be stretching, might be stretching a point slightly there, but uh, you're not wrong. You're not you might wrong. be, you might be. But I am. I'm quite pleased to say that uh, about an hour ago, um, um, I I just sat right down to say it again and and, and made myself a little list. Um, and uh, I'm uh, reasonably pleased. I mean, there's such a huge number, and I, I'm pretty sure I only scratched the surface. Um, and and I'm going for it. Okay, so I've got Driver Eight, obviously, but it's not the driver that most people would think of when they see that title. Doctor Doctor, um, one about teaching here to sir with love, love a bit of Lulu. Um, let's see, uh, Drop the Pilot. Remember Joan Armour Trading? Oh wow, yeah. How about Last Night a DJ Saved My Life? Uh, send in the clowns or tears of a clown um some elvis costello shipbuilding and watching the detectives son of a preacher man the joker the boxer really proud of this one wichita line man <laughs> excellent farmer john and my personal favorite there's it's a profession deal with it mr tambourine man there you go <laughs> excellent work all that and yet nothing for the headmaster ritual well change days yeah i know i know and i mean i I was really going for, and I know it's in the titles, and you know, if I was going for songs rather than just titles, I would have gone for for Panic, um, as well. But um, yeah, the less said about the Smiths and their lyric writing, um, at the moment, the better. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's entirely entirely fair enough. I do think you made a very good point when you talk about the sense of perspective about this song, though. I think it is one of the things that makes it an interesting piece because, um, I mean, you've you obviously you've identified um, sort of letter songs and all the rest of it, and it would be kind of interesting to know whether this was a a specific reaction to that genre or if it was just a grab bag of stuff. But either way, the other thing about this is that it's a very new song by the time the Beatles are covering it it's only a couple of years old you know again last episode we were talking about the music man that um uh, with uh, till there was you and yeah. that was what five six years previously this is only a couple of years and if if uh, the Ian McDonald book is to be believed then they were covering it a year after it had been uh, released I'm sticking I'm sticking with Mr McDonald at this one but, but that's not uncommon I mean if you listen to um um elvis costello uh talking because his dad played in one of those um sort of show bands that would play a lot and in fact they would record um um up-to-date songs um and and basically he would get all the new singles listen to them and then work out how to play them and then they would record their their own version and you know you would see wouldn't you and there are there are occasions that if we'd done some research um, I'm sure we could we could uh, bring to mind where you'd have several versions of the same song in the chart at the same time. Didn't it all happen with the Beatles and Billy J. Kramer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to know a secret? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, it's like, well, hear it. We're going to record it. And, and, and it would be money for um, the record company because, you know, again, you know, just to sort of slightly rehash previous conversation, you know, record companies in, uh, would tend to invest in songs 
rather than bands and the Beatles were regarded as the one that broke the mould because they were writing their own songs. Um, but then that might explain why, you know, it was just so easy for um, I Want to Be Your Man to, um, you know, to be given to the Rolling Stones because, you know what, it's extra income. The Beatles, they might not last, but these songs that they've already written, great, we can make as much money off them as we possibly can. I was going to say, that's how he got, that's how he got into the Beatles, isn't it? Because his dad used to record basically cover versions of, of right. Beatles songs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, just sort of sitting down transcribing it, trying to work out how it was being played. It was not an uncommon thing. So um... absolutely no, but I, I think also it, it. I mean, yes, that's that's absolutely true. But I, it's also the speed with which they are absorbing these influences. You know, we've talked before in the podcast about the kind of songs that they're covering. They're covering a lot of black girl groups and from America. They're covering a lot of stuff which you know the old cliche about sailors bringing in records to Liverpool docks and having access to music that maybe, you know, wasn't out there in the wider world, all that kind of stuff. They, it, it's just the sheer speed of, that they can kind of pick this stuff up and, and deliver it. And for all that, you know, we've both been sort of fairly critical of, of this as a cover version. I mean, you know, it works in its own merits. And, and particularly, um, I think it's maybe unfair in a way to compare it to the original recording because at the time of release... 1963, um, how many people in the UK would have actually heard the Marvelettes original in any case? There's a fairly good chance that this would be their first exposure potentially to this song. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, it, it does it does function in its own way. Um, but just the speed with which the, those, those influences can be absorbed and then, you know, plowed back into their own songwriting style is, is you know, genuinely very impressive. You will be pleased to know that it did not chart in 1961. Um, and in fact, the Marvelettes didn't have a hit in, uh, in the UK until 1967. Okay. One thing that does kind of slightly confuse me, though, is that it is listed as um, reaching silver certification in the UK. But um, I guess that could be... Um, sales over a very long period of time um by the way worth worth pointing out that the follow-up single um in well in america at least to please mr postman for the marvelettes was twisting postman <laughs> um i missed that from my list and uh, they followed that up by with playboy which i also missed from my list if indeed you can regard playboy as an occupation oh yes. later on there's my baby must be a magician <laughs> see it's it, it's a thing it's a thing. Yes. Yes. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that's really given me anywhere to go, but yeah, you're, you're no, right. That's, no, it that's definitely a theme. I'm, I'm not arguing with you. <laughs> the Marvelettes. They were good. There you go. Yeah, let's, let's move sure on from were. that. But yeah, you're, you're right. It's the, the, um, you know, the being able to, to take the songs from girl groups and black girl groups and push it to a wider audience um for 62 63 64 genuinely revolutionary so um you know that's that's really important that they were getting on and they were doing that um yeah so um you know another reason to believe that the beatles were just so far ahead of their time I've given you nowhere to go with that either, have I? Um, no, not a lot of places to go, and I think that's fine. I think we can probably call it there. So um, I guess that means score time. Uh, what do you want to give, please, Mr. Postman? Oh, um, I mean, it's uh, straight down the line, six out of ten, really, isn't it? Um, yeah, it closes off side one um, with a reasonable flourish um, and picks people up again after the fairly dirge-like till there was you. So, yeah, um, I'm six out of ten, perfectly decent. Fairly forgettable. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, we should have probably mentioned the fact that this kind of rounds outside one of the album and didn't, but you have now, so that's good. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. Um, I think I'm going to give it 5 out of 10. Um, I still don't feel the performance is very good. I don't like the way that it flattens out the original, even if what I said before is true about maybe it's a little unfair to compare the original. Well, too bad I'm being unfair. Um, so, yeah, I think mm, 5 out of 10. I'm happy with that. I'm happy that you're happy. <laughs> no half points and no French. Fair enough. Is this the first time I've given a song a higher score than you? I mean, normally I'm I'm the fairly harsh one, but... Uh, I think it, if it's not the first time, it's one of the first times. Yeah, it's, it's unusual that I end up going lower. But in this um, case, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, right, moment in history, folks. Lovely, excellent stuff. Right, we can wrap it up there. You can contact us by email. We are beetlesstuffology at gmail.com. Uh, we're on Twitter at Beatles underscore ology. You can find more of my writing on music and TV and movies and a whole bunch of other stuff at www.jgmacquarie.scott. Please like, rate, and review us on whatever podcast you're using so that more people can find the show. Next episode, we flip the disc and head over to side two with Rollover Beethoven. And of course, we hope you're going to join us for it. But until then, keep listening.